Okay, we'll keep going, please. Okay. All right, so if you look at the, there's two photos, and the first photo is just an outside picture of the, our house, which is the little green one, and then you'll see a big white house right there. You'll see a big white house on the left, and then you'll see a yellow house hidden by trees, and then another house behind it. And you can see that our house is really quite small relative to our neighbors. Um, and also there's a Google map satellite image, so you can also see from above. Um, can you guys not see anything, or can you see I, it? I, I, we see it now. Yeah, yeah, right there. So that's the Google Maps satellite image. So you can again see our house is the, the little one with the red dot. And then you can see our neighbor, which was the white house to our left, and then our neighbor to the, to the right, which is the yellow house, and then the house behind it, which is the other house that you can see in the photo. Um, and also our, um, so since we've owned it and we've never increased the, we've never increased the size of our house and our, the previous neighbors did get a variance approved in 2001 to expand it, um, but they never, they never carried it out. Um, and they did get approval for that variance above what we're actually asking. We're asking for slightly less than what they asked for. Um, and we're approved. And, and yes, and we're approved. Um, so that's the first section of the, that's the first section of the zoning regulations. And then the second section is section 35F5, which is um, the, again, because we're not legally, we're legally non-conforming, are, there are parts of the house that sit, because it sits askew, there are little parts of the house that are too close to the side of the um, property line. And so we are raising parts of the roof um, and because we're not raising the roof any higher than our neighbors or anything higher than what is um, legal, but because the house is already non-conforming, anything that we do to basically any part of the house requires us to get that approval. Um, and then the third one is the picture you're seeing right now, which is section seven, no, yes, section seven one B, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, um, so this, this, this photo shows the back view of our house and that orange triangle is the part of our house that sits off the, um, what's it called? The, um, uh, the setback line. So because it's our house, totally yeah, because our house is askew again, it, that corner is the part that's um, beyond the setback line. It's the existing part of the house. So this is actually what it'll look like once um, we do the renovation, it's just, it'll look the same. It's just the house that that part of the roof is going to be raised about, I don't know, a foot and a half. So we keep the out ceiling inside. So on the outside, it just looks like that, that roof was just raised a foot and a half. So it's a, it's a pre-existing non-conformance. So we're just raising the roof and uh, so it's, it's, it's still be non-conforming, but we're raising it by a foot. Okay, so those are the three sections of the New Canaan zoning regulations that we're asking, that we asked a variance for, and now that we're asking special permit for. Um, and when I looked at special permit criteria, it asked us, um, you know, what if there's going to be a change in the, the the use, and it's still going to be a single family home. It's still going to be our single family home. So there's really no change in the existing and proposed use. Um, we have carefully tried to improve the curb appeal of this house. So, um, and we've, we've worked with our neighbors. We've been neighbors, we've been living in this neighborhood for a long time. So we know our neighbors and we've really talked to them a lot. Um, and they have um, supported our, our plans and they've written in to, um, to the New Canaan Town Hall with their letters of support. Um, we've made sure that they're, you know, none of the changes should affect any of our neighbors in any way that is adverse. Um, we're, it's still going to be a single family house. So there's really no change in the transportation use, which is, um, which is one of the things that they ask. It's still going to be our house with our cars coming in and out. Um, where uh, as for adequate public utilities and services, again, it's just still going to be a single family house. So we don't see much change in the water supply, sewage disposal or storm water drainage. Um, and I think that's, that's it. Do you have any questions for us?
Yeah, commissioners, questions for the applicant? No. I think John Chris is raising his hand, Lynn. Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm looking at your point one under site and proposal. You mentioned that you want to increase the coverage by about 325 feet. Uh, so it, the coverage increase seems to be just a uh, rear and front porch that's going to be created that do not now, now exist. Well, little, yeah, so we have to build forwards because that back corner of our house is already non-conforming and close to the close to the um, setback line. But there is a back porch there right now in the in the back that um, that we've decided to close off so that the kitchen can be even so that we can have, so there's no dining room in this house. So everything happens in the kitchen, the dining happens in the kitchen. So just to have a little bit more space for a table. And then in the front, it will go forward a little bit more than what it's basically, if you see, if you look at the front, oh, I don't know if you can see it in, our, in the photo, but in the photo, we have this little rock wall right now in front of our house that, um, that has our plantings and it'll basically, the house will be come forward to just where that rock wall is, a little bit beyond that rock wall. And then yes, there'll be a porch added. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the uh, yeah the expansion to the front is really to expand the living room to make it a more comfortable size. Right now, when you when you walk in, there's a very small entryway, so it would you know create a living room there. There's also a first floor bedroom and and bathroom that is undersized to make that a normal size. Um, add the porch, and then as Mimi mentioned, just the you know the kitchen in the back. It's just closing just off that back porch to make it square. So all, of the 379 you know square feet. 250 of that is is porch. Um, sorry, if that was your question. So in the front, the whole front wall of the house is going to be pushed forward. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and in the back, you have that drawing of the, uh, it looks like a porch going up. You're going to enclose that? No, so the drawing is actually what it'll, what it'll look like. So if you, um, if you look at the drawing, there's that orange portion. That orange portion is the part that's non-conforming, right? Yes, and yes, then, yes. right. And then it, to the right of that, that those two new windows are what is on the current porch. There's a current porch there. And that'll be closed off to square off the room inside. So you're going to cannibalize part of the porch and make it habitable yeah. interior yeah. dwelling. Yeah. And, uh, so uh, there's already a footprint there, but the footprint is porch and it's to become house. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the front, it goes from sort of a rock wall and some plantings to house, it becomes a house. It's going to be enclosed. Yes, right. 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 It'll be enclosed. Okay, thank you. And the, what type of plantings or anything are you planning in front of the new porch front of the house? Um, well, we don't plan to have as much plantings only because mm -hmm. we do have kids that like to play on our front lawn. <laughs> so we don't want to have too many plants. We just want to have plants to make it kind of look good, but really to keep maintain as much of our lawn as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't gone to the level of uh, getting, you know, landscaping designs or anything like that, but we don't have plan to, to do much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hey, would any of uh, commissioners, any questions, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, seeing none, um, would anybody from the public like to address this application? You know, hold on one second. I've got to unmute them one by one. Um, wait a second. Anybody wants to address the application, but raise your hand to give Lynn the heads up about that. Well, I, so most people have their name on the screen, so I can't see them. So I'm going to do it one by one. But um, all of you that have your name on the screen, if I'm trying to un un unmute you, you just have to unmute for a second. Um, Betty Lovestick, did you want to speak on this application? No, I didn't. Okay, thank you. Jack Liebau, did you want to speak on this application? No, thank you. Uh, 
Hold on one second. So, Looking forward to when we can have these meetings back in town hall. <laughs> Randy, did you want to speak on this application? No. Thank okay. you. Uh, the, the, it, I think we're good, Lynn. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. I just want to make okay. Thank good. you for your presentation. This hearing is closed. Um, item number two, 146 Canoe Hill Road. Upon application, David De David Rucci, Lampert, Tui, and Rucci, authorized agent for David Carroll Graham owners for a special permit of Section 37E to allow building coverage of 6,495 square feet in lieu of 6,276 square feet, increase of 219 square feet allowed under 35D by restricting 484 square feet to a height of less than 18 feet for property located in the two acre zone, Mr. Rucci. Yeah, hi, good, uh, good evening. Um, yeah, so this evening, we're representing the Grams. They uh, were longtime residents of New Canaan. They've moved away uh, for about seven years, and they're now coming back to relocate here uh, in New Canaan. They purchased this property on the corner of Canoe Hill and Brushy Ridge Road. And in their retirement plans, they basically want to have um, a full single story living. Um, and that's what they're hoping to do with this application. Um, essentially what they've done is we're trying to under 3.7 E uh, to exceed the building coverage by 219 square feet by um, encumbering uh, twice that amount at 484 square feet um, on the front of the property that faces Canoe Hill Road. Um, the front of that property in and of itself right now has like an open area, sort of an open entryway porch and much of the construction is starting there but then it does extend a little far out. Um, I was wondering, Lynn, if you could show the survey map for that. Okay, one second. Thank you. Uh, most of the properties in this neighborhood are, are, are quite large. Um, in fact, there's a property uh, around them across the street that's got to be over 20 acres, which I wasn't even aware of. Um, so there's very little uh, neighborhood um, uh, who are going to be affected by this particular um, application or by this particular proposal. Um, we, uh, the lecture group is the one who's going to be um, actually constructing the property and nothing's changing as far as the special permit criteria with respect to the use. It'll still be a single family use, but as I said before, it's going to be, uh, so here's the current uh, survey right now. Um, you can see how it sort of goes back on Canoe Hill and on Brushy Ridge Road. Um, and if you go to the proposal, you'll see um, where the front is going to then be. You see how they have that covered entryway there now. Uh, that's what's gonna be expanded. You can see, there we go. Um, the area that's gonna be um, enclosed, thank you. And then the additional area uh, for that first, first floor there that makes it another couple hundred square feet. Uh, above coverage. And uh, we thought it was a good idea to limit that area itself to under 18 feet because that creates a nice um, look to this particular house as far as it is on Canoe Hill Road. Not that there's that many neighbors around here, um, but it will lessen and deaden any sort of impact that that area would have um, on Canoe Hill Road based on the fact that it's going to be less than 18 uh, feet in height. Um, there's no other real uh, improvements on the property. There are a couple little pockets of wetlands that we're not touching. Um, we were uh, very fortunate to have um, the septic approved really in the nick of time uh, on Friday evening, and we can't thank uh, the health department enough for that. Uh, Jen Ileson, you know, honestly stayed until 6.30 in the evening to, to get that work done for us, which we were very appreciative of. Um, but we do understand also that uh, the town planner didn't have as much time to actually review the plans based on the fact that we were waiting for that health department um, approval, which should, should be in your file, um, be in your file now. Um, once I said, there's no, it's going to continue to be a single family residence. They're just looking for single floor living, this particular family. Um, and um, we believe it fits in with the neighborhood. We believe that the, the regulation itself was, was, was put into effect to, to promote uh, first floor living. Um, 
And we also believe that, um, you know, by encumbering twice the amount of the 219 square feet that we're requesting um, is, is a, an appropriate trade off for allowing the additional uh, coverage. That's pretty much all I, I have for this application. Uh, commissioners, uh, questions to the applicant, Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner, uh, unmute. Uh, yes, I see. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, David, um, the deed restriction on the uh, rear part of the house, um, I guess there's a, an emergency generator and some tanks out, out in that area. What, um, why is there a deed restriction? Uh, the deed restriction, the deed restriction will be on the front of the house that we're um, not able to build above that particular section. So if you recall when, I, I want to say it was also during that 2005, when we were, when the commission was really wanted to try to promote um, first floor living, they were a little bit, uh, they wanted to allow some additional coverage in order for someone to, to, to build going flat across their lot, but then they didn't want to see them also go above that particular um, area. So one of the things, and I think it was Ms. Kuzlecki who actually was the one who, who really promoted that was, you know, to somehow work with allowing this first floor unit living, but if we restrict the second floor, then, you know, that sort of tie into to keeping the, the lot development down. Um, so mm -hmm. in this, I don't, I haven't seen this section used a lot. I know Mr. Finn's used it once before. I think uh, Boris Pogacic used it once before. Um, but essentially, you know, it's designed to allow a little bit of extra coverage on, on, the, on the ground level, so long as you limit the second floor. And that's the encumbrance that I'm talking about, um, I think that you're referring to. Thank you. Anybody else, commissioners? Everybody good? Okay, by the way, uh, as an administrative comment uh, for this application, I see that uh, Mr. Flynn and uh, Mr. Radman have joined uh, the hearing. Um, would, any, would anyone from the public like to address this application? So I, um, I don't think so unless um, Mr. Deere is here to speak on this application, but he won't let me unmute him, so I don't know. Well, I guess that's um, uh, a sign. Ms. <laughs> 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 Love is Everybody good? Um, okay. Uh, question. So. Okay. Question for Wait. Lynn. But uh, yes. Okay. Question for you, Lynn. Uh, in in Lynn's defense, um, she was twenty four by seven last week working on the reopening of downtown. Um, so as Mr. Rucci noted, did not get much time to review this application. Lynn, are you comfortable with us closing this application or would you like to uh, keep it open and give a little more of uh, your thought to it? Um, ideally, if you guys would keep it open till June, that would be the ideal. Um, I don't see anything um, that jumps out as a red flag and um, the, the biggest, the biggest, um, uh, bump in the road was getting the health approval, which came through late on Friday night this week. So um, that limited my review to it. Mr. So, Root, what is your uh, client's timing? Are they okay with a one month delay or is that problematic? I mean, they'd like to start as soon as possible, but like I said, I mean, the town, I mean, if the town planner needs more time, I'm not gonna object to that. I mean, to your point, all the staff and all these, people at town have, all have been doing is, is working overtime. So if, if they need extra time, I'm not gonna object to it. It's been hard. Uh, commissioners, um, I'll ask you the question, what's your advice? Do you see anything that concern you that we should have Lynn take more look at or not? I have one question, John Chris. Um, the generator would seem to be on road frontage, not on the frontage itself, but facing the road. I'm, I'm trying to remember seeing something like that before and I can't, I'm just wondering, how it ended up there. Usually that's the sort of thing that tends to be tucked in the back out of, out of viewpoint from the roadway. Just wondering. 
I'm sorry, I'm not even sure why that why that is in that location. I do pass it every day. It's it is there. <laughs> it it just seems like an odd location. Um, they tend to be tucked away out of sight, as opposed to essentially in front of the house. Um, there is a lot of screening there. There is a lot of screening in that area um, on Canoe Hill Road, but I, I don't have an answer for that question. Okay, I'll tell you what, Mr. Rucci, why don't we uh, get uh, Mr. Chris an answer for that? And uh, this is a complicated regulation, so uh, probably better safe than sorry. I apologize to your clients, but perhaps we'll keep this open for a moment. Okay. Okay. Okay, this hearing is So I'm, I'm just looking, Mr. Goodwin, so I'm just going to be looking to get an answer on the generator's location and then obviously give Lynn, uh, the town planner, more time to, to review. Exactly. Okay. 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 Great. This application's closed. I mean, uh, continued. Sorry. Three seven, item number three three sixteen Town Mitchell Road. Upon application, Mary Lou Adalja King and Parag Adalja, owners for a special permit of section three four, to allow renovation of an addition to existing detached garage located in one of two front yards on a corner lot containing a single family residence for property located in the two acre zone. Who's here to present, please? Hi, I'm uh, Wayne DeVanzo. Wayne, County can, you, uh, can you, can you Do you hear me? Yes, can, you can talk. You can present. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, yes, uh, the, the project is a renovation of an existing garage that is in one of two front yards. Uh, it was constructed in 1965 or earlier. Uh, the, the proposal is to renovate the garage. There will be an addition, of about a seven foot addition to the depth of the garage across, across the rear. Uh, the second floor will be a family recreation room with a sink. Um, there will be a balcony overhang and there'll be the ability to park to, to the side of the, the garage, which is the case now. Um, it, it's, uh, it will remain a two, a two car garage uh, as far as the, the bay goes. Uh, the uh, health department has approved the septic plan, which accommodates the new sink in, in the second floor. And B a B100 plan was done showing a code compliant septic system um, on the property, which was sent to the state. Uh, there are no lights or, or signs proposed. Uh, no change in use, it's remaining a, a single family house with, uh, with this two car garage, uh, you know, in the same, in the same location as it currently is. Uh, a, a variance was approved last month for the addition to a non-conforming structure, uh, being, being the house, uh, being in the front setback. Uh, there's a second story addition to the house also being proposed as part of this, and that's what the variance was needed for. Uh, meet the coverage requirement, it, it's, it's conforming and conforms in, in every other way, and uh, that's about it. Okay, questions for the applicant, please? Everybody John comfortable? Perez, I, have a, I, I have a question. Uh, it was mentioned uh, that there's going to be a, a, a garage addition family room with a sink. Could you provide a bit more detail on exactly what that's going to look like? Is it one story, two story? It, it's, it's one story. It, it, well, it's the, second, it's the second floor. It's the second level um, sort of loft area. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a video room, a family room. Uh, it will, it will have a sink in it. No, certainly no living quarters, no cooking facilities, uh, or anything along those lines. How will you access this? Is this a stair? It's basically or? Open. There's a stair. Yeah. There's a stair from, uh, next, right next to the, um, the cars in the first level. It, that's mostly why the addition in the rear is, is required. It's the stairway that gets up to the second floor. Okay. 
an exterior stairway you're planning? No, it's a, no, the interior, the access from inside the garage. Ah, okay. You will enter and exit into the garage, the garage door. Yeah. Or, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, yes, sir. Can I ask you a question? Mr. Ward? Uh, yes, sir. You said obviously, obviously you're going to have plumbing if you're having a sink. Is there going to be a toilet? I don't believe, no, I don't believe that's proposed. I think it is just a sink. I don't believe there's any bathroom proposed. No, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I heard that correctly. Dick, you were asking if the garage the shows toilet? a full bathroom. Full bathroom. If, if there's a, going to be a sink, a bathroom a facility. So, for the record, that's Mr. Turner uh, answering Mr. Ward's question. Yes, actually, I, I believe it is, it is a half a bath. Yes, it is. It's a sink and a toilet. Yeah, sink and a water closet. That's it. Hey, uh, Mr. Turner. Um, is will there be uh, cooking or any kind of a, a kitchen on the second uh, floor? No, no, it is no, no. It's just uh, that half bath, and it's it's just mostly an open room, um, and that's it. No, there will be no no kitchen, no cooking facilities or sleeping quarters. Mr. Chairman, may I add something? Sure. Um, just for the record, everyone keeps asking about the cooking facilities. The Zoning Board of Appeals actually conditioned the approval with their variance that they couldn't have any cooking facilities or cooking areas in that um, space. So there will be no cooking areas or kitchen like facilities. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Mr. Chris. I had a further question. Mr. Yes, I'm looking at the note. Is John Chris speaking? Uh, I had a, looking at the note from the Department of Public Works, it mentions um, they were looking for an accounting of impervious area to be removed, impervious area to be added, and uh, which would include any gravel areas, and wondering whether the impervious area would size would trigger a drainage certification policy. Does the applicant stating that this drainage certification policy review would be triggered or would not be triggered given the uh, intended uh, changes to your house? Yes, uh, it, it is the, the last conversation I had with Maria is my understanding that the, uh, the stormwater requirement would not be uh, triggered. Uh, it's the, the increase in purview services is, is less than uh, 500 square feet, or, which would be what would trigger it. Thank you. Okay. Anybody, anybody else? Okay, would anyone from the public like to address this application? Let, let me know when we're good. Don't, Mr. Chairman, I don't. Okay, so uh, this application is closed. Um, item number four, 635 Frogtown Road, upon application, Stephen, Stephen Finn, Wolves E. Rose, and Quest, and Koreansky, authorized agent for New Canaan Country School owners for special permit modification approval of sections A2B60 to amend condition four of the commission's June 16, 2018 special permit and site plan approvals to build a new athletic facility. For property located in the two acre zone at 635 Frogtown Road, Mr. Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, with me here tonight uh, from the Canaan Country School is Aaron Cooper, head of the school, uh, and board of trustee members Randy Salvatore, and I believe Stephanie Ziegler, though I haven't seen Stephanie on the Zoom, but I, I can't tell whether she's on or off. But I know Randy and Aaron are both here. 
Um, you may recall that this is an application to amend. Thank you. Uh, you may recall from the last hearing that this is an application to amend condition number four, which required the installation of blackout shades in the gymnasium uh, portion of this new athletic facility. <clears throat> It was uh, our position last time that given the fact that uh, New Canaan Country School uh, now owns the immediate adjacent property, which had a house on, which has a house on it that was located about 234 feet from the new athletic facility location. And given the fact that uh, windows were not really installed, but this X-Tech wall system was installed, and the fact that uh, the lighting uh, is gonna be significantly muted, that the reason for the condition uh, really no longer existed. Um, during the last hearing, some questions were raised about the difference between the construction lights, which were the ones that generated uh, the comments from the neighbors, but the difference between those lights and the permanent lights to be installed. Uh, and there was also a request that we consider getting an additional photometric analysis. Uh, we also, uh, so we did that. We got a, a, a letter from Vitalite, which is the electronic, electric uh, lighting experts that have been used for this project. That letter and a number of attachments were submitted to Lynn uh, last week. And uh, uh, before I go any further, um, can I inquire about whether the commission members had an opportunity to review that letter? Mr. Finn, we received the letter at least five days ago, so yes. Or a couple okay. of days ago. All right. We, have, we, we got it before right. the well, weekend. Thank you for that. Uh, so the letter, I think, does a good job of explaining the significant differences between the construction lights and the permanent lights. And so just for an example, and I was, I was struck uh, dramatically by the picture of the construction light that was part of that letter. And uh, perhaps quickly, when you could, you could pull up the NCSS template that's uh, among the materials we plan to present tonight. It's the last item. Okay, give me one second, I'm going to pull it up. What was the title of it, um, Mr. Finnegan? The NCCS template. I think it's the last item listed on in the applicant's presentation materials. Uh, Lynn, you, the, the, the materials were broken out between our original present, our original application materials and the presentation materials. So I want to make sure you're in the presentation materials part right. of, the, of the site. Yeah. Hold on one second because I will get it up for you in one second. <laughs> Just I knew it was going to take this long. You can keep talking on the request. <laughs> All right. So that's okay. There are two uh, we'll, there are you'll two see letters. You, uh, when that comes up. It is, it's, it's, the, it's the NCSS template JPG. But anyway, I, I will continue. The, the letter, I think, makes it very clear that the permanent lights will be substantially less bright and have much less glare than the permanent lights. And in addition, um, well, here it comes, I think. Yes, there's, there's the light. And you can see the size of that bulb. And 
Lynn, the letter also had attached to it the specifications for that light, which is the first item in that in that grouping, uh, which is uh, HID lamp info. Can you bring that up quickly? First item in that list. Excellent, thank you. So there's the can bulb that goes it? in the construction light and you can see that the, I can see it. Then we, we see it. Okay. Okay. Come, Mr. Finn. So, thank you. And you can, you can see that the, the expert highlighted the lumens for that bulb and the beam spread, which is the lumens are 36,000 and the beam spread is 360 degrees. So that's the construction light. That's what everybody's been seeing uh, uh, at the facility. And the lights that were inadvertently left on one evening, I think, or maybe more than one evening, all night long. Um, but the letter also encloses photographs of the, um, of the new lights and also provides spec sheets for the new light. And you'll see, and Lynn, um, if you can bring up uh, NCSS gym light. Can you see it? So that's the, that's the light. That's fine. Everybody good? John, uh, you good? Yes, we can see it. Okay, I'll continue. So you'll see that that light, that's, the, that's showing the NCSS reflector for the permanent lights and the lens that gets installed on the bottom of the light. And then lastly, Lynn, if you could just bring up the, uh, uh, the gym light, uh, I think it's the PDF. I'm sorry, no, it's the other one. It's the specs for the gym light, which will show that the, um, Yes. The next exhibit shows what the lumens are for the permanent lights. I think that's it, Lynn. Click on that, please. Yes. So those are the specs for can the permanent see? lights. And you can see, you can see the lumens are around 18,429, which is about half the lumens of the construction light. Uh, in addition, as you saw in the previous photographs of the permanent light, that has a shade which directs all the light downward. It will not shoot any light out in 360 degrees. It aims the light downward. Um, and so there will be no direct light being beamed through that x -Tech wall, which we just talked about last time. You may recall that the x -Tech wall is, is not window, it's not transparent. It's, uh, it's a smoky kind of material uh, that is two inches thick. And so it's far different from a clear window or clear plastic. And um, so the x -Tech further significantly mutes and dims the light compared to a glass window and a glass window that is through which that construction light is being uh, shown through. So uh, the permanent lights produce a maximum of 18,429 lumens, about half of what the construction lights show. The wattage between the two lights, the construction light is 450 watts. The uh, permanent lights are 150 watts. Uh, moreover, as uh, the letter that we submitted indicates, the permanent lights are controllable, and the plan is to reduce the output of those lights by 20 to 30 percent. So even the amount of the lumens, which is half the construction lights, is going to be reduced by 20 to 30 percent. So in conclusion, uh, the light from the expert concludes that the permanent lights will be 70 to 80 percent dimmer than the construction lights, and the light will be focused down and will be diffused. Um, and as I said, the X-Tech material will also significantly mute and dim the light. 
we were also asked to uh, uh, ask the experts at, uh, about conducting a photometric analysis at the neighbor's properties. Um, the letter that we submitted last week addresses that as well. It says that the original photometric analysis confirmed that no illumination coming from the new athletic facility will go further than 50 feet from the new athletic facility, 50 feet. The neighbor's houses are more than 800 feet away, and thus clearly a photometric analysis conducted from their homes would show zero exterior light levels coming from the school projecting onto their properties. Now look, I went through this last time, no one disputes that if you turn on a light in somebody's house, you may be able to see that light from perhaps, uh, you know, uh, a mile away. I mean, we've all had experience flying in an airplane where you, you can look down if you're low enough, you can see lights on in homes, but that cannot be the test here because I think that throws out the baby with the bath oil, to sort of put it quickly. Um, <clears throat> so um, there was another email submitted by a third neighbor today um, indicating that their property is about 200 yards from the new gym. Well, that's effectively 600 feet, uh, two football lengths. And my quick measurement on Google Maps showed that, that house, the house itself on that neighbor's property is 800 feet away, which is similar to the two other neighbors who, uh, who have written in letters. Um, <clears throat> With regard to these recent emails from the neighbors, uh, they raise concerns way beyond the scope of our current application. Uh, they talk about concerns about uh, uh, amendments of conditions regarding screening of the building, traffic, location of the building. Again, those are not issues before the commission, but I do want to I do want to address those concerns by simply stating. That the commit that the, that New Canaan Country School has no intention of seeking any further modifications to the granting of the original special permit for the new athletic facility. So there are no concerns about changing the screening, no concerns about changing traffic patterns. Those are those issues are closed. And again, there's no intention to file any further modifications from uh, the original special permit. <clears throat> uh, the letters also, or the emails also mentioned that this general sense that conditions of special permit should not be modified, period. And with all respect, that, that is not how things generally work. The New Canaan zoning regulations and all Connecticut municipalities allow for amendments to previously granted special permits. The statutes and regulations recognize that conditions can and do change, which do impact these special permits. There's nothing wrong in seeking a modification to a special permit. They are not frowned upon and they're specifically authorized. And we often, we see those uh, more than just occasionally in, in, in the case that someone seeks a modification of a special permit because of change conditions. Um, specifically, the neighbor's concerns about screening uh, I want to point out to everyone, and both the commissioners and the neighbors, that there is another condition of the original special permit, uh, uh, special permit approval. That's condition number 16. That condition requires that the planting shown on the last approved planting plan have to be maintained in a healthy condition and must be replaced with new materials if not adequately maintained. So the screening will remain, we're obligated to maintain the screening and the thought or the concern that the screening is somehow gonna go away or die and not be replaced is, is uh, taken care of by condition number 16. <clears throat> um, one of the other topics that came up uh, at the last time was the cost of the shades and the budget for the project. Clearly the shades were not part of the original budget for the project because the shades were never discussed, as I recall, during the public hearing. The shades came up for the first time after the public hearing was closed, and NCSS, McKenna Country School, had no opportunity to respond to that request. 
Uh, please also bear in mind that since that original application, the Canaan Country School purchased the Moore property, which was an expenditure in the millions of dollars. That certainly was not part of the budget for the new athletic facility. <clears throat> the New Canaan Country School knew that many of the conditions that found their way into the original approval were solely, if not primarily, intended to address the very vocal concerns of Ms. Moore, who hired legal counsel and a landscape architect to represent her. Again, the Moore's property was, is different than the current uh, neighbor's properties because it was only located, it's located on the same side of the street, is abutting, uh, abuts the property line of New Canaan Country School. And again, the house was only 234 feet away, far different than what we have here now. Um, now, I want to make some other general comments. Um, I think the issue that you are faced with here is a very slippery slope for a number of reasons. Special permit and institutional uses are crucial to the success and vitality of New Canaan. They contribute to the overall atmosphere of our community, enhance the livability of our town. We have a perfect example here whereby New Canaan Country School allows its facilities to be used for a very, very nominal price by New Canaan Basketball. And there's a letter that I saw submitted by Bill Driscoll of New Canaan Basketball uh, stating uh, how crucial it is for them to be able to use the New Canaan Country School gym space from six to nine o'clock during the week. Um, institutional uses are specifically allowed in this zone. Those uses include elderly housing, adult housing, congregate housing, skilled nursing facilities, private schools, public schools, and group homes. Now, here's the point. The point is, is that those are all special permit uses. How could you let, regulate the interior lighting of a group home or an adult housing or elderly housing, you still have a viable adult housing or congregate housing, or if it was a high school gymnasium where kids, sometimes these games are on at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, how could you regulate the interior lighting for those kinds of facilities? The same analysis should apply regardless of the special permit use. The degree of the light that's impacting neighbors, and we maintain that this is very minimal in our particular case, that lighting is, affects neighbors, uh, and here in particular, you have, this is in a two acre zone where these houses are 800, 900 feet away. So it's a very slippery slope, I think, to start regulating this interior lighting. Um, furthermore, this is not a new institutional use. The country school has been at this location since 1936. That's close to 85 years. It predates zoning. It is not a new institutional use like Grace or like the Glass House, which is, was originally a residential use that was changed to a special permit use. So this has existed in this neighborhood long before any of the neighbors who wrote in emails purchased their homes. I did a quick check on the, uh, of the assessor's uh, records and these homes were, booked, were built in 2000, I'm sorry, purchased by their current owners in 2014. 2011 and 2008. It's not like we're bringing in a new use. And I think we all know that these institutional uses are constantly upgrading their facilities. We've seen significant changes to the high school, to the middle school, and because these facilities have to keep and maintain their facilities. And remember, the gym that this new athletic facility was replacing was built in 1984 it should come as no surprise that these schools and other institutional uses have to upgrade their facilities. Um, <clears throat> so um, a couple of more points. And again, as always, I appreciate your attention. Um, it's my view, and I think it's the correct view, um, that when a commission considers placing conditions on a special permit or institutional use in a residential zone, that it must be in the context of what could be built as of right in that same zone. So that the conditions must be, can't be any more regulatory than what you could regulate with regard to a residential use 
unless there's a vast difference between a residential use and a the special permit use. So here, the point is, is that New Canaan Country School could have built a residence of the same size, same height, same location as the new athletic facility. It meets coverage, it meets the height restrictions, uh, it meets the setbacks. And so we, they, they could have built, a, a, anyone could have built a residence of this size at this location. And the commission would not have had the ability to regulate the interior lighting of a modern home built on this site that is the same size, but has floor to ceiling glass windows and the lights could be left on way past nine o'clock. That should be your measuring stick about what's appropriate conditions for this use. And I submit that going beyond that is ultra virus, if you will, that it's really beyond the scope of what the special permit criteria are meant to address. Um, so as I said, and, and, and and let's, let's continue on there for just a, another minute. Remember that the special permit application for this new athletic facility was only required because of the amount of grading and site work that was going to be done. That's why we needed to file a special permit. We didn't need a special permit for height. We didn't need a special permit for exterior lights or interior lights. We just needed a special permit for site grading and to the extent that that requires special permit conditions, you're, you're absolutely within your power to do that. And you should do that to the extent that that particular aspect of the special permit application has a negative impact on the neighborhood. Um, so I submit that if a house was built here, that it's, it's lighting could have a much greater impact on the neighbors than, than this facility, which requires the lights to be turned off by nine, which does not have a lot of clear glass windows, where the lights are pointing downward, and where the material that, that is up in the uh, upper uh, part of the building is this two inch thick smoky material. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I think we, there's been a loss of, of, of perspective here with regard to what we're talking about. Um, and this is where this, I think the slope gets even more slippery, if you will. And, um, all of us here who live in the Canaan know that we have a need for senior housing and I, and I wish I had seen the, uh, more of the presentation by Krista earlier this evening. I, I, I tuned in late, so to speak. But we all know we need senior housing. We all know that we need no, new zoning regulations. Senior housing will undoubtedly have a lot of windows, undoubtedly windows where the interior lights will stay on well past 9 p.m. And likely such a facility will be located much closer to residential homes and properties than 800 feet. How can a text change for such a new use or even, a, or even special permit applications for uses already authorized, as I mentioned, adult housing, elderly housing, et cetera, be allowed if blackout shades are not going to be required in those instances as well. There's no difference in the impact on the neighbors, whether the light's coming from a gymnasium or whether it's coming from a senior housing residential facility. Um, so I, I question, does the Planning and Zoning Commission have the power to regulate interior lighting? And do you really want that power? And so I, I took another look at the special permit criteria in your regulations, which you probably are familiar with. It's section 8.2.4 of the regulations. And I see nothing in there that allows you to regulate interior lighting. The closest one is 8.4 B triple I, little I. I don't know if you guys have your regulations in front of you, but that reads as follows. The proposed use or activity shall have no adverse effect upon the neighboring area resulting from the use of signs, exposed artificial lights, colored lights of any nature, flashing lights, 
loudspeakers or other noise making devices. Now, the way I read that regulation is it, it's, it's meant to regulate exterior things, exterior lights, loudspeakers, noise making devices that are outside. I don't think that an exposed artificial light is an interior light. And therefore, I respectfully submit that this is something that, that no commission has the right to regulate. Now, I, I will admit that there, are, there have been some applications before you where the, the applicant has agreed to such conditions. They've agreed to it, and that's a different story. Uh, New Canaan Country School did not agree to this condition uh, uh, as I recall, it was placed after the public hearing was closed. And they, with all respect to all of you, don't feel that this is necessary given the circumstances of the type of lights we have here and how far the neighbors are away from this property. Um, so um, I also would respectfully request that you consider the plan of conservation and development which discusses helping the quality of life of each individual resident in our town. We have a letter from New Canaan Basketball describing how crucial having the gym open to 9 p.m. is to 150 to 175 New Canaan children. Is the proper balance between the POCD and, 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 and ensuring the quality of our community life when balanced against uh, the type of light and the proximity of the neighbors that we have here, does the balance really tip in favor of requiring the country school to put in blackout shades, which, is, which it really is not going to do, or requiring the gym to close down by 6.30? I, I, would, I think the PLCD tips in favor of, in this particular circumstance, uh, pr protect, protecting the community interest over the, the interest of a few neighbors. Um, now, um, I was asked by Lynn whether whether the New Canaan Country School could agree to any any um, any compromise, and I've had discussions with them since the last hearing, and they're not in a position to to pay two hundred thousand dollars to to put up these shades and. So they would accept uh, or they would, you know, they'd be okay with uh, changing the conditions so that the gym has to go dark at 6.30 p.m. except with special permission of the town planner, which is already part of the condition. They would also uh, agree that you could put in the amended condition if you feel you have to go in this direction. I really, obviously all my comments were meant to try to convince you that this, our original application to amend this condition should be granted as is. But if we cannot get a majority, um, they would uh, agree to the 630 shut off and allow and would, would consider maybe in the future, five years, whatever, maybe installing the shades at that point if they have the money uh, and allow that to be at their option in any amendment to the condition. Um, so, um, I try to get through this as quickly as possible. I, I do refer you to the exhibits uh, that we submitted and the letter we submitted. And uh, as always, I wanna thank you very much for your, your time and I really appreciate your attention. Okay, thank you, Mr. Finn. Uh, commissioners, uh, questions for Mr. Finn? Mr. Radden signaling? Yeah, I'm unmuting. He's uh, he's on two of them, so it he's, should be unmuted right now. Mr. Radman, I think you're already unmuted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, Mr. Finn, thank you for your presentation. It's an interesting approach telling us what we can and can't rule on. Uh, considering the history that the commissions had with lighting issues at various institutional uses in town. But um, to the application and to the submitted material, there is a cut sheet for the light fixture that's being proposed um, from RAB, RAB Corporation. It's a high bay fixture. There's a reflector and a lens. 
what's missing from the submission is the photometrics that show how big of a beam spread that lens has and what impact it has on the space. Um, any reason that was omitted? Uh, I, not that I, I know of. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not a lighting expert, Mr. Radman, and, I, and you raise a fair point. So we should. A, a beam spread. I, I mean, I do think, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there is. I'm looking at the cut sheet online. So there's additional information that's part of that light fixture submittal that should be submitted as part of the application. Um, secondly, I think what would help us a lot, as you know, on the history of this project, there have been many iterations of this building uh, with various versions of clear story uh, glazing, uh, whether it be translucent, transparent, clear, uh, louvered. Um, we, we went through a number of hearings getting to a specific architectural design and massing that people were satisfied with. I mean, at one point, there was over 600 linear feet of clear story. I was just looking through my files. I do happen to have all the previous submissions on this application. Um, so there were a number of um, versions that were more impactful, and I think this one's less impactful. I think what would help the case and what would help the, the commission understand the description here about how this new, how this proposed fixture has a focused light pattern and beam spread is a cross section. It's something I asked um, last, at last meeting is a cross section through the building to show where that light fixture sits relative to the sill height of that clear story. If, it, if it's level with or below, then we have confidence in knowing that the light is going to be focused down below and not visible through this clear story and then the issue really is it, it's less of an issue um, but if the fixture and that lens produces a light that's clearly visible through the clear story and makes it more of a beacon then it's a different discussion so that that cross section and the mounting height uh, it may already exist in some of the drawings but that would be helpful in getting this thing over the goal line um. <clears throat> I, 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 Mr. Rabin, my understanding is, and I, and I, I think we, we may have talked about this last time, is that the actual height of the permanent lights is, go, is not going to be below the sill of the x -Tech material. It's going to be uh, about halfway down the x -Tech. So is that, mm. is that clear? In other words, about... Yeah, that answers my that that answers my question. But then that then makes it that much more important to understand the beam spread of these fixtures and what impact it will have on the uh, clear story. So, um, just so we're clear, the clear there, when you say clear story, I, I I think of of something that's transparent, like clear glass. This is no, this is uh, no, it's, a, it's an architecture. It's an architectural term referring to the top band of glass on a wall. Uh, when you have a ribbon of glass or a portion of glass, that's the upper portion of a wall between it and the roof. Which is which is what we have here, I believe, in the latest version. Uh, the, the, I know this, that the, the actual elements of these lamps, these permanent lights, are not exposed, you know, that, that rim that we showed at the bottom. Yeah, no, no, understood. Um, so so there's, there will be no light directly aimed towards outside. It's all pointed downward. And yep. in terms of what the disbursement is, I, look, I assume they're gonna light the entire floor of the gym. So, so there yep, will be course. some dispersion from these lights, but it seems to me that with all things considered, given how, uh, low this is compared to the construction lights, how, what the shades do for these lights, aim everything down, nothing through the X tech that we're, we're but we going don't, but, we, but we don't, but we don't know that. I know you're saying that, but none of the documentation uh, shows that the beam spread doesn't hit the X tech. Dan, this is Stephanie speaking. Um, it, you know, you're correct. It's gonna, some light will uh, cascade out, but it's, it's completely focused down. And the, the light source itself is in the very top inside um, highest part of the light, the LED chips, they're not even a bulb chip. 
So once you have that um, edge of the canopy of the, um, of the top of the light, there is very little, almost no reflection beyond um, the angle of the, of the hood of the lamp. Right, but the submission, the submission in the cut sheet that you, you guys submitted as part of the package shows a part number D as in David, L as in Larry 16, which is a clear prismatic acrylic drop lens, which is, looks to be about six or eight inches high that's dropping down to provide beam spread. So that prismatic lens is gonna to glow to some degree and have a beam spread on it. Even though the LED element is up in the fixture, that lens mm -hmm. is gonna glow. And that's, that's what I think would be helpful for the commission to understand is the beam spread of that light in relationship to a cross section of the building, where, the, where these windows are, what the heights are, and how ineffectual it is. It is. We all hear the argument, we understand it, um, but, mm -hmm. It, there doesn't seem to be that one piece of supporting information to substantiate it. I don't have the tech, I don't have that sheet, but I will say that the, um, you know that that lens is a diffuser in and of itself. So it's not anywhere near what the light going down would be. So the diffusion is already additionally diffused from what the light is putting out. Plus we have the x deck, which is, as you know, a huge diffuser as well. Right. Um, I hear right. what you're saying, but I'm just I'm saying it's not, it's not, significant whatsoever comparatively. Uh, Mr. Chris? Mr. Chris? Um, yeah, John Chris uh, speaking, uh, two points. One is the argument was made that um, this um, shade issue was really to solely support uh, or, or uh, benefit uh, Ms. Moore when she lived in that house, which is subsequently purchased by the school. Um, I'm not on that page. My sense is that she was certainly the most affected by light spillage, and she was really leading the charge there, quite clearly in my recollection. And the other neighbors were not uninterested, but their view was that she's carrying the water on this whole thing, investing a lot of time and effort, and we will benefit from her uh, efforts. So. It's not that we're uninterested, it's simply that, you know, she was the person who was leading the charge and we, we the other neighbors, would benefit from whatever uh, successes she enjoyed. So I have that point. The second is uh, a point I brought up, I think, in the uh, prior meeting when we discussed this, is that uh, um, file me under seeing is believing and that the only way I think we're really going to understand what this... Uh, new lighting concept that you're uh, suggesting means for the neighbors is to is to see it. It doesn't mean you have to fully install it and then fully uninstall it, but some even if it's jury rigged, but jury rigged enough so that the neighbors will get a sense of, okay, here's what it's going to look like. What do you think? It could be that, you know, it's, it's a non-issue. It could be it's an issue. I don't know. Right. But uh, right. unless I see it, I'm going to tend to err on the side of caution and, um, have something that will benefit the neighbors so they can enjoy their property without uh, light glare and spillage. So that's my view. I'd like to see an actual test so I really know what's going on. The only way we're really going to know is that we see something. Uh, Mr. Turner? Yes, I, I think there's a, a lack of understanding about <clears throat> how uh, light reacts. It's, it reflects off of surfaces. So um, even though these fixtures have a diffuser and that they're focusing the light down, the light will reflect off of every shiny light surface. Um, this thing is going to light up like a giant flashlight. The clear story will be illuminated. Um, you'll see it against the night sky. And, um, you know, the, the other part of Mr. Finn's discussion about um, the temporary construction lights versus, uh, you know, the permanent lights and the lumens are much less with the new lighting. Um, you're, I don't think you're being correct or accurate in your analysis. Um, the construction lights were probably four or five in total. The new lighting in the uh, gym will probably be, what, 20 fixtures? So the argument about the lumens being less um, on the new lights um, 
you know, there's no consideration given for the additional amount of the new lights versus the construction lights. So I think that argument just really doesn't hold water. Um, <clears throat> there will be perceivable light from every neighbor uh, ne next to that facility. Um, so, and you know, to, to finish my comments, uh, you know, about, you know, the PNZ, we don't have power, we don't have the authority to talk about uh, or dictate interior lighting. Um, had the building been designed and understood what kind of light impact it would have, um, we wouldn't have to um, come up with shading and, and devices. Um, this could have been dealt with on the design of the exterior, and uh, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Anyway, uh, yeah, you are going to see the light. Any other commissioners? Yeah, I, John. Mr. Flynn? Yeah, I'd like to comment. Um, I go back even, even further more when we passed this in 2018. And um, if you will, the, the, the agreement that we had, if, if, when we make a decision, it's an agreement, was that uh, there would be no light. And there was a problem with a single neighbor that went beyond that. And, and uh, that was discussed and it was settled by the school uh, by uh, purchasing that house. So they settled, they settled that issue. But the agreement with the rest of the neighbors at large was that would not be no would not be any light and here we are talking about well how great is that light going to be or how little is it going to be uh how offensive will it be or so we're, we're to my mind we're off the, the discussion point the discussion point to my mind is is uh how do you go how are you going to shield this so there'll be no light coming out because that was the agreement and what you what what the the school is trying to do here wants to do is to change that agreement and we find ourselves talking about light volume and I think it I think it needs to go back and be more basic to the point that uh, the agreement was there would be no light and how do you get us to, back to that without you putting the shades up that uh, that we agreed to in the beginning okay commissioners any other questions for the I think we need more basic argument than the light on it. Mr. Bowen, maybe I, I can else? respond Mr. briefly. Sure. Yes. Mr. Goodwin. Uh, yes, just please. Quickly. Um, yeah. A uh, couple of points. I thought it, we, we admit that there's going to be some degree of light emanating from this building. And, and to the extent that ever, anyone's interpreted my remarks as indicating there's going to be no light emanating from this building, uh, I, I apologize for not being more clear on that point. There, there, there's going to be light coming out of this building. We just think it's at a level that people who are 800 or 900 feet away really are being super sensitive about it. And as Lynn's memo points out, you know, you do have the New Canaan Winter Club right next to, to, to these properties. And that light is, is, is uh, not going through x -Tech material. It's bouncing all over the place. And um, it's going to have a much more impact than, than I think this facility will have. And I, I, I do want to just tell you my memory of what happened at the last, back in 2017 when this thing was originally approved. I, I stand by by my, my recollection that the country school never agreed to this condition. This is a condition that was placed and was raised for the first time in uh, the draft uh, approval. My recollection is there was a draft approval and a draft denial, now, and that as a as a sort of a way of trying to navigate through this, that this condition was placed. I also know that at the time this condition was originally placed, it specifically mentioned the Moore property. It said in order to prevent light from 
going towards 579 Frogtown Road. And then, as I mentioned in our original papers, there was an additional amendment at the time the settlement was approved by this commission that took that language out. Now, why that was taken out, I'm not really sure, but I'm not saying that neighbors didn't complain about, some neighbors complained about the traffic and, and all, and a little concern about light, but I go back to the point that this is 9 p.m. Um, and that this property is far, far away from, from this light source. And you could have much greater impact from residences in this area than you will from this without any ability to control it. Um, so uh, that's, uh, it's, it's a shame. I mean, uh, that we can't really, apparently uh, we can't satisfy all the commissioners on this, so. Mr. Okay. Goodwin. Any other this commissioners? Is Randy Salvatore. Can I? Mr. Goodwin. Go ahead. This is yep. Randy Salvatore. If I could just make one um, brief comment. Obviously, from the school's perspective, and I guess from my personal perspective, when we did accept that condition, well, obviously we didn't introduce it, we accepted it, we did believe it was for the Moors, and I think we probably wouldn't be had had, had that or gotten that far in the discussion if it wasn't for the Moors in that situation. That being said, the condition is there, and there clearly um, could be argued a benefit to other neighbors because of the condition, as many of you have just articulated. Um, and in no way do we as, as Mr. Finn just said, do we believe that there is no effect, meaning that you're not going to see some light. Um, that's just not a realistic, um, realistic statement. Um, we don't believe that it's of, it's of a level that should be bothersome to a neighbor, but that's our opinion. Obviously, different people have different opinions. Um, one of the things that Mr. Finn had talked about in the initial, in his opening, that I wanted to see if the commission would consider as um, as a modification to our condition, at, at least. Um, and that is that right now, as we've said, the New Canaan Country School does not use this facility at night, never does other than once a year or so for a special meeting, which we need to get approval for anyways, if we went after on that period. It gets, we allow a nonprofit group to use it at a time. We, we charge them to, um, just for someone to be there, just to, to, to really turn the lights on and talk, we hard, charge them $100 to do that. So this isn't a money maker. It's purely, we've done it for that purpose. But what we're faced with now, because we have fiduciary responsibility to the school, is to spend $200,000 for lights that in no way benefit New Canaan Country School. Um, it, it benefits others or if we were to ever want to do something in the future. So, so the ask is that if it seems like the commission is inclined to, to want needs in some fashion, that if we can have a modification to the condition, something along the lines of that, if the school does not put the shades in and spend the money to do that, then we would abide by, let's say, a 6.30 ending date every day. If it's some later date in the history of the school that the school would like to use it towards that nine o'clock condition, um, then we have to put the shades in at that point. So therefore, the neighbors are protected because they're not being faced with life. We don't have to spend the money now um, for something that we don't benefit. And quite honestly, while we accepted that condition initially, it was based on trying to make a deal for the property because we were bending over backwards. We've got $200,000 of extra landscaping in there. We did all that to benefit, to try to settle the moors as we, everyone encouraged us and we were encouraging ourselves to do. When we did make that acquisition for the Moore property, which we never intended to do, as, as you know, we had assumed, and perhaps incorrectly, that some of those conditions would have been relaxed at a later date, um, this being one of them. And actually, this is the only one we're asking for. Clearly, that's not an assumption that we should have, should have made um, at the time, but now we're faced with a situation where, where, um, where we have a condition that is burdensome and we don't get any benefit. Um, so, so I ask if, if there's an alternative to the condition that um, something along the lines of the way I've outlined, which maybe can satisfy everyone and provide flexibility in the future if the school ever wanted to go towards a nine o'clock closing, which is one of the conditions. Um, question for the planner. Where's the planner? Right here. Okay, there you are. Um, I assume that as part of our discussion, once this application is closed, is that a condition we could put on this? You can, you could put a condition on it. Um, typically the or applicant would, I'm sorry? 
or however you want to term it or modification for the lighting no my question is would the applicant have to come back in to us a second time for a new modification or would we conceivably if this was the answer we went with is this an answer we could go with um what mr you could probably, was proposing you could you could probably go with it as is i would just edit uh, mr salvatore's comment to say something like they would have to present proof to the town plan and i could sign off on it either way okay mrs uh Tiscornia? need to unmute her lynn oh sorry and mr um turner also wants to speak Um, the only problem I would have with that is that, and I know the country school has no um, responsibility for New Canaan basketball, but New Canaan basketball really does depend on that gym space. Um, there's not a lot of gym space for these kids in New Canaan country school generous in the past. I would hate to say basketball is out because of these blackout shows. Um, you know, I, I would hope we could come to some other compromise instead of just shutting out basketball because there are hundreds of kids who use Canaan and country schools, gyms, um, you know, every day in the winter. So yeah. I don't know. I'd be so quick to say, oh, well, just no gym time for New Canaan basketball. And I know New Canaan country school, what they're doing is very generous and I thank them for that, but I just hope we could find a different compromise yeah no that would be that would have to be part of our discussion i simply wanted to ask the planner while we we're in a public meeting as to whether that was a viable, viable option which he says it is okay okay um any other commissioners uh, mr. mr turner kent turner um i just had a question for randy about the uh, maintenance and uh, as far as the cleaning of the gym would, would that uh happen during the day or um have you given that one some thought? Sorry, I'm unmuting you right now. Thank you. Sorry. So, um, Ms. Turner, you're talking about is on a regular basis, when do we maintain the gym? Yes. Um, I believe, but I'll defer to, to Aaron Cooper, who's the head of the school. I believe that our actual school day typically ends at 4.30 to 5 o'clock. So that's really the latest that we use it on a regular basis. So that extra hour or so is what, what I was allowing for in terms of cleaning. But I'll defer to, to, uh, to Aaron Cooper on the timing of what we use it on a regular basis. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is Aaron Cooper, head of school at New Canaan Country School. And uh, uh, to my knowledge, on, on the sort of typical day, um, particularly in the wintertime, the um, custodial services happen in the gymnasium uh, after the country school's last use of that um, space, which is uh, usually a practice or a physical education class, and then occasionally a basketball game or a volleyball game. Um, in the season when New Canaan basketball is using the gym, uh, that custodial work happens in between the school's use and New Canaan basketball's use, so that uh, when New Canaan basketball is finished, which I believe is around around that nine o'clock time, um, then uh, the gym is is closed and lights are shut off. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else, Commissioner? Mr. Rodman. <clears throat> um, question to Randy or to Steve Finn. Um, <coughs> the overall design. It's been about a year and a half since the approval was given for this, and I know construction is already well underway, obviously. Have there been any um, <clears throat> modifications to the facade or the design or the X-Tech wall or any of the detailing that could help inform our decision? You know, more X-Tech, less S-Tech, um, different height on the gables. I know there was a series of gable forms at each of the uh, east and west elevations. I don't believe so. Stephanie, maybe you can comment. I don't think there's been any modifications at all to okay. what was approved. Is that correct, Stephanie? That's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Salvatore, follow on. Um, the screening for the former Moore property, was that was that put in? Or, or well, you not did not yet, put it in because you did not have to? No, no. So, so that we're not... We, so that condition was there and we still intend to follow every bit of it. 
quite on which it's just not done yet because obviously the construction is still going on but right. so that plan is still right. planned to be implemented yes uh mr goodwin if i can jump in i i believe in our original submission for this application we uh attached a copy of the landscape plan that uh, should be in your materials it's pretty robust yep okay thank you Yep. Um, commissioners, uh, I'd like to take it on to the public. Great. Mrs. Discornia. Mrs. Discornia wants to speak, actually. Hold on a second. What? Mrs. Discornia wants to speak? Yeah. I, I just have a quick question about the um, landscaping for the Moore property. Why, why is that moving forward? It's my understanding that the country also bought that property, right? Correct. So why would you, I mean, do you intend to keep it as a private residence for someone else or? So to be determined, it would be a private residence because that's all that we can do with it now. So, um, so we were following through because it was a landscaping plan, which was approved, quite honestly. Um, but it's a $200,000 landscaping plan, is that correct? It's, um, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. Obviously, all of it isn't on that side, but there was a lot of screening all around. But yes, yes. I, I'm just wondering if we could relax that condition and maybe find some funding for the blackout shades. Um, I, obviously, I can't make that determination, but we're open to everything. And also, just to clarify, too, we in no way want to be, um, you know, turn turn our back on New Canaan basketball. It's just, we're, we're faced to, like any board, we have a fiduciary responsibility to the people that contribute, and that's really the situation. And the other thing is, Things are different today than they were three months ago for any school, whether it's our endowment and so on. And we need to be practical. And that's really why. So, so I don't want to misrepresent in any way of why we're, um, you know, why this is so important. Um, but, but unfortunately, it is today. And we have to do responsibility to the, to the school and the people. Who I, I hear you. And what I'm trying to do well, is to clear, yeah. find out if there's some way, I mean, <clears throat> do they go forward with whole landscaping project on the side of the Moore property if that doesn't really exist anymore? Sure. Yep. I follow on to that. Mr. Finn, do you remember, um, or does anyone remember, maybe Mr. Salvatore, mm -hmm. commissioners, as part of this settlement, um, I think we did take some conditions out, or, or am I incorrect on that? There was uh, a slight, I, my recollection, uh, John, was that there was a slight modification to the landscaping plan, but we did attach a copy of the current plan, the one that actually is a viable condition uh, to a submission that of, uh, to Lynn of April 24th, 2020. There's the landscaping plan is there. Right. And uh, I think, frankly, there's some very, very, I made to this point at the last turn, there's some very, very tall trees there to be planted, uh, which I think helps to buffer this building and um, some of the light that might impact uh, certainly Mr. Liebau and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Liebau and perhaps Mr. Bazell, but I'm less sure about that. And if you, if you, I don't know if Lincoln can call this up, but uh, there's already some uh, landscaping, existing landscaping there. So this new landscaping plan is all new plantings and it is very, to my mind, still very, very robust. Um, so, but that is, that should be in the, in, in the file. Okay, commissioners, before I move on to the public, uh, any last questions for the applicant? Uh, Mr. Goodwin? Yeah. Just one, um, one point, you, you guys asked what, um, so what condition had been modified in March of um, 2019 when they went to settlement and it was condition number eight with respect to the building location that was modified. The building location you said, Lynn? Yes. Okay, that was the only one then. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only one that I recall distinctly. Um, Mr. Okay. Finn, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Okay, uh, that's good enough. Okay, why don't we move on to the public. Um, before we open it up to the public, I, I will note, um, that uh, we've received uh, multiple letters, which we have read in detail. Um, and of course, we heard uh, testimony last month as well. Um, so would anyone from the public like to address this application? Yeah, there are at least three people here. Hold on one second.
Um, Mr. Bozella, do you, do you want to speak first? Hold on a second, I'm trying to unmute you. Can you hear me now? We yes. can hear you. Yes. Uh, sir, we can hear you. Can you try again, please? <laughs> bad can we also hear the gentleman? I am not. No, bad connection. Okay, let's uh, let's try Mr. Bozella in a few minutes. Let's go on to another neighbor, please, or another okay. uh, member of the public. Mr. Lipo, did you want to speak? Hi, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear yes. you. Thank you very much. I am, thank you, commissioners, and I'm cognizant that we've been at this for an hour, so I'll try to be brief here. Um, but I, I guess the one area I agree with uh, Mr. Finn is that this is a uh, slippery slope, and uh, I, I do very much uh, believe that the PNZ commissioner and, and commission, excuse me, um, you know, does have power and authority here. And we as uh, residents of New Canaan, you know, do trust you and, you know, thank you for your, your uh, time and commitment to protect our property values and, uh, and uh, quality of life here in New Canaan. And as one commissioner, and I'm, I apologize, I didn't recall the name here, said and, and believed, you know, I, I do recall writing two letters before the, uh, the ultimate approval here expressing concern about the lighting, even though all of the neighbors here on Frogtown Road, none of us got notice before the uh, initial application. With regard to the lighting, which could go in excruciating detail, but don't worry, I won't. Um, you know, today we heard that it will have substantially less light and less glare, that the light will cascade out, and that's all, you know, kind of compared to the construction lights as a baseline, which I think all of us agree were pretty egregious. But, you know, looking at the April presentation that the applicant um, put forth, we look at Vital Light, they claim that there would be no measurable light beyond the property line. Um, and then we have other presentations by Vital Light saying it would be 20 to 30% less or 50% light. So I'm just, I'm certainly no electrical engineer, but I'm, I'm just confused by what seem to be somewhat contradictory numbers and information that seem to be coming out. And, um, you know, the lighting study from Damon says, or Damon, sorry, says that, uh, you know, there's a disclaimer that says the information supplied by others and hasn't been field verified. So I don't know the extent to which we should actually, uh, you know, draw conclusions from that. I, I would certainly, you know, agree with the commissioners who at the last meeting um, said that there is definitely uh, an issue of perceived light. And this is a massive building and, and certainly, especially in the winter, when we have less foliage, there's going to be very visible light especially in a dark sky. Um, you know, I, I am very sympathetic to New Canaan basketball. And so, I mean, Mr. Finn talks about quality of life for 250 youths versus just a few neighbors that we shouldn't really worry about. Um, so I would hate for us ever to get in a position where 250 or so youths, like my 12 year old son, are, are said to be thrown on the street because of a few neighbors. Um, recently, Country School, where our twins go, issued a memo within the last month saying they're in strong financial condition. Um, so I don't see why they can't continue to live up to their commitments to install these window shades. It was a condition that the PNZ Commission properly, in my opinion, put on this construction project. And I think the PNZ can properly do that on behalf of the town and behalf of all of the neighbors, not just 579 Frogtown Road where formerly Catherine Moore lived. Um, indeed, this was done for all of the neighbors, not just one. And I think it's somewhat of a novel uh, legal theory to say the applicant bought the property, therefore we can pick and choose which conditions the PNZ commission 
put on for us to discard. Um, the, the comment that the attorney for the applicant said that, uh, well, the winter club has a lot of light, so it doesn't matter if we have some on our property. I mean, it is seasonal light there. And the neighbors who bought in, I guess he's, he noted, 2011, 2014, whatever dates. I mean, we bought knowing full well that that light existed. Um, this is brand new light and much more substantial, I believe. You've seen the pictures. So I think that's a difference. Um, that's, you know, that's the reason I believe and my wife believe that uh, you should uh, deny the special application. The New Canaan basketball is a real issue, I believe. The, uh, they, they need this space four days a week from 6 to 9 p.m. That, I think, strengthens the case for the window shades continuing to be used because this space is going to be needed a lot and light will occur from this building uh, four days a week till at least 9 p.m. And uh, thank you for your time and interest. Thank you, sir. Who else from the public would like to address this application, please? Do you want to try Mr. Bell again? Uh, let's try yes. the next neighbor and we'll come back to that gentleman. Oh. <clears throat> Hold on one second. Um, Mr. Bradley? Mr. Bradley, do you want to? There you go. Wait. Wait. Okay. Check one more time. Where'd you go? He's on mute. I know. I just unmuted him a second ago, but where'd he go? He's, he's, he's on my screen, but he's on mute. Yeah. Uh, I think he's unmuted. No, no. Oh, there you are. Are you unmuted now? There yeah, can you hear me? We can. Th thank you very much uh, for letting, letting me speak. I have absolutely no experience, I would say, in dealing with a commission. So if I don't frame things in an official tone, please forgive me in advance. Uh, we, we're on the same side of the road as the school. Um, I obviously e echo everything that Jack said, Jack Lebo said. We agree with that. What it just seems to me is that at every sort of solution that you as the, the commission seem reasonably to, su to suggest to them, they have a yet another excuse as to why that can't be correct. You know, if you say you don't need the landscaping, they, they start prevaricating. Um, he offers lights that seem to be less bright, but then very conveniently leaves out how many of them there will be, which I thought about and I know one of the commissioners mentioned. It just seems to me there's a sudden lack of honesty, perhaps, um, and straightforwardness in what they're trying to achieve. I'm sure there's a solution. We would be happy with you know, either the gym being shut or the shade staying in place, but they don't seem very interested in finding a compromise. They seem more interested in just getting their way. We're fine with the application as it was put in. Um, I think this modification is not, they don't seem very interested in accommodating us. They just seem to uh, want, you know, to, they're interested in getting what they want. Uh, and the fact that the, the extra $200,000 would affect a 15 or $20 million project on a school of this size just stretches, you know, credulity enormously, um, which makes me worry if they're not honest in this, um, you know, what else are they not being truthful about? Um, I like the idea the commissioners put forward saying, let's see the lights, let's actually have a look, and then we'll know for sure, as opposed to just taking their word for it, which seems to me a difficult one to do at the moment. Hey, I hope that you. makes some sense. Thank you, sir. Um, then maybe we'll try Mr. Bozella again. Okay. <laughs> Uh, getting dropped earlier, you know, problems with hitting the merit at the wrong time. The only thing I would add, uh, and I uh, echo both uh, Jack and Simon's thoughts, uh, the only thing I would add is, is, is I would ask that the commission not borrow from one uh, nuisance mediating uh, to uh, bolster another. I think blackout shades and the robust landscape are both crucial uh, to lessening the impact of the abilities on the neighbors. And I think they both have different roles in, uh, in those efforts. 
So I think uh, lessening one to strengthen another um, it weakens the effects of the both. And uh, that's the only point I wanted to add. Okay, thank, you. thank you, sir. Uh, Lynn, do we have anyone, anyone else from the public? The only one, I don't know who WZ459's iPhone is. There's uh, Mr. Driscoll raising his hand, Lynn. Oh, okay. Um, WZ459's iPhone, are you trying to speak for this application? Okay. Lynn, do you have Mr. Driscoll up there? Yeah, I'm going to get him there. You should be able to unmute. There you go. Okay. Well, um, hey everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Driscoll. Uh, I, like Mr. Bradley, is my first time presenting or speaking to the P and Z committee. So, excuse me if there's anything that's not f formal. But um, I'm Bill Driscoll, and I'm the vice president of the NCBA uh, in charge of operations. So I've had very, uh, <laughs> um, let's call it. Uh, extensive knowledge with the issues that our program has been having over the past three years that I um, provided for you in a letter with regards to gym time and gym availability and um, how critical the country school is to our program's ability to deliver its programs for the number of teams that the parents, kids, and families in town are asking us to provide. You know, basketball presence in town is on the upswing. It's, you know, um, and the NCBA is a significant talent generator and talent feeder to many high schools um, uh, in the area. Um, every single starter on the boys and girls teams at, at, um, at the high school last year played in, in the NCBA. Um, and for us, if um, we were to lose access, if the 6.30 cutoff time was, was to become a reality, we simply, um, the effects on the program would be drastic. Um, uh, we would have to um, scale back the number of teams significantly. I mean, so uh, there's, I just want to reiterate that there's a real ramification here to to, to, to kids and families in town, if this start time were to get rolled back, um, simply because there's no gym time available. Um, and I mentioned this in my letter, but I wanted to really call it out that the effects would be significant immediately. They would be exacerbated, accentuated school year after next, when the public schools institute their later start time. Um, and that could ultimately mean we can't have a basketball program, a travel basketball program, um, two years um, out once the school start times put in, um, the later start times are put in effect because there won't be enough gym time available for more than a handful of teams to practice if the country school gym time isn't available to us. Um, so um, no hyperbole here. It is, it is critical to our program's ability to function um, and will be absolutely essential um, the year after next. So um, I just wanted to make sure that I uh, reiterated how it, important was to us and just to let you all know. So I thank you for the time. I appreciate you hearing us out and for considering the effects on our program and our, and our services uh, to the town. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Finn, uh, Mr. Salvatore, Ms. Ziegler, any concluding remarks? I see Ms. Ziegler. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to answer Mr. Rodman's uh, question about height. The lights come down to 22 feet off finished floor in the gymnasium, um, which as mentioned early, earlier by Mr. Finn, residentially that would be not very tall at all um, comparatively. And to Ms. Um, Discornia comments, um, we weren't set out to decimate the neighborhood. That is not our intention at all. We love New Canaan, obviously. We love our open campus and we love the feel of the area. 
the intent for keeping all the landscaping is to keep the feel of the nature and, and the context and everything. Um, the building was necessary for the program and for the world today, but it doesn't mean we were looking to ruin anything. The lights are going to be off no matter what by 9 p.m. That is not considerably late. Um, so I, I just think it's a very different story about trying to blast things out versus what we're accommodating, which is a 9 p.m. shut off, not a 24 hour situation. So I think there's a distinction there. Thank you. Mr. Salvatore, thank you. Mr. Salvatore. Oh, um, let me, sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Goodman. Um, just uh, two quick comments. One, I would just like to um, just comment on one of the things Mr. Bradley had mentioned in terms of being forthcoming, the one thing I will emphatically state to you is that from the beginning when we started this process two years ago until every statement that the school has made through, we have been forthcoming, we have been honest, we have a long history, and there has never been and never will be an intention to mislead or to not provide information. Obviously, we might have a disagreement um, as we go through this process, and that's part of um, life in terms of that. The last thing i just leave you with is one thought, and obviously we're trying to look for some kind of uh, in-between to try to make it work. Um, but, but if you ask yourselves one question, if the country school had owned the Moore property a year ago or a year and a half ago when we went through this, would we be having this discussion about blackout shades now? And my, my suggestion would be that that would not have come up. Um, particularly, these are not even windows up there. This is, these are not even, it's not even technically glass. Um, up there. So, um, so, and that's what brings us to this point and why we've brought this, this application back to you is because we don't believe it would have been a condition then. We don't believe it's significant impact to the neighbors. Um, and, um, and that's why we're here. That's why we didn't come back on a lot of the other conditions that we thought maybe they would have benefited others or benefited the project in the long run. This isn't one that we personally see as a benefit and don't think it would have been a condition if we had owned the more property as we do now. So thank hey, you very uh, much for your consideration. Quick, quick question for anybody, including Mr. Driscoll, just remind me, it's in front of me someplace. How many days a week does New Canaan basketball use um, the country school? Presently, um, four. Uh, four, um, four to five. So uh, primarily weekdays for practices for our teams. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Goodwin, just real quick, I, 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 I do, like, like Randy, I, I do uh, bristle a little bit about, uh, about the allegations about, uh, you know, credibility. And, and the comments seem to focus on sort of on what our expert has said about light emanating from the building and what that lighting chart means. That lighting chart does not mean that you can't see the light. It just means that no light from that building is going to be illuminating the other neighbor's property and so I, I'm sorry if we haven't been clear about that but uh, we've done our best to, to answer all questions that have been posed we may have missed a couple of items that we didn't know about through the fact that we're not lighting experts but we really tried to comply with what we were asked to do at the last hearing and uh, and yeah. as always thank you, thank you for your time thank you um trying to desperately find an exit strategy here. Um, I'm not. Um, Mr. Radman, um, have you gotten the answers that you needed to make a decision as a commissioner? Uh, no, my question was, well, n not all the information. It's the light spread from that, um, from that lens. I, I know we've talked about it. Their cut, cut sheet is not fully, is not complete. I understand the height of the light and it's halfway down the X tech wall. So there will be some illumination of the wall. Um, I would just having more information on the light spread would make me feel more comfortable about what impact it's going to have on the glow of this wall. Um, okay. uh, Mr. Mr. Salvatore, Ms. Ziegler, uh, Mr. Finn. Um, I don't know where the commission stands on this, um, but um, you know, I would like to find a positive exit strategy for everyone. Um, I was sort of hoping that your lighting expert would have been on the Zoom call tonight. Um, might have helped, maybe not. Um, you know, is it, I, I think we can continue this one more time, but it's up to you as the applicant. If you don't see the point, then you know, that's fine. I, I should ask the commissioners as well. And that, that, that was the reason, quite frankly, for my question for Mr. Radman. 
Um, so if I could just address that, typically how I've, I've presented projects like this relative to light uh, infiltration and light dispersion is a cross section through the bill. I've mentioned a couple of times, a cross section through the building, showing the window heights, showing the sill height, showing the light, the position of the light fixture and showing the beam spread. It's a very simple diagram that could help explain to the entire commission as well as to all of the neighbors the intensity of the light that's going to be hitting this X-Tech wall. I think we all want this to happen. We, we, we don't want to limit the hours of the, of the operation of the uh, gym relative to how it's going to affect programs like the basketball program. But I think we all need to feel the warm and fuzzy that the decision we're making is, is well informed and that we have all of the information in front of us. So, um, so, Mr. Rabin, I have no, and I have not been directly involved with the lighting consultant, so I apologize for that. So I couldn't answer any of those technical questions um, from that perspective. But, um, but if there's such a thing that we can get to you, then personally, um, I would ask Steve from a legal point of view. But no problem for us, as long as we can push push this off for another month, we'll get you whatever we can. And and if it's helpful to have the lighting consultant on the call, that's fine. That's fine also for us. Um, so, so if we're clear of what, what you'd like us to see and, and um, have, have someone answer any detailed technical questions um, from anyone on the commission, it's certainly fine, fine with me. And then there was one item that I brought up during the last meeting, uh, Mr. Salvatore, the proposition that we would future proof the facility, you know, the granted you wouldn't put the shades in day one, but would you be willing to consider wiring and preparing everything to receive shades such that at a future date, if the final product of the construction and the lighting output of the building is, um, you know, contested at a later date by the neighbors and brought to the attention of the Planning and Zoning Commission, we could then circle back on this in, you know, six months after opening or whatever it is and say, well, you know, it is proving to be a problem. We'll need you to put the shades in. So I, Stephanie, I believe we we did look into that, and, and I don't think that's a problem for us to do that we up, agree. Up, up front. Yeah. So so we can do that as well. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Mr. Finn, am I correct that with your permission we can continue this one more time? Uh, yes, especially under the uh, most recent executive orders regarding uh, land use applications that gives right. an extra okay. ninety days. Yes. Good point. Yeah. Um, any commissioners, are you okay with that? Yeah, I think it's the right thing to do. Okay. So, uh, this hearing is continued. Um, thank you. To, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Give me a chance. I'm exhausted. I got to figure out where I am on the agenda. Okay. Regular meeting item number five, deliberation, any possible action on a closed public hearing item. Um, let's start with item number one. Oh, by the way, um, Mrs. Nielsen, you're, you're all over the commission tonight. Now you're seated for Mrs. Grislecki. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, 20 East Maple, uh, Mr. <coughs> Flynn and Mr. Radman, were you guys present for that application? I don't know when you all joined us. Yeah, I, I joined, joined it. I got in 10 I, minutes after the start. Yeah, I, I, I was not present for it. Okay, so Mr. Flynn, Mr. Radman, I suggest uh, you do not vote on this application. Agreed. Uh, Tony East Maple, do I have a motion for approval or denial? I move we approve. Reasons for approval, Mr. Chris? Um, I think the uh, impact on neighbors and on the community of the planned expansion is de minimis at best. The uh, planned expansion of the house seems to be in keeping with the vibe of the neighborhood. Uh, I think we'll improve the housing stock of New Canaan. Uh, I, I really see no negative externalities from this um, uh, intended construction. And um, I think it would improve the quality of life, not only for this uh, homeowner, but I think it would improve the tone of the neighborhood. So I'm in favor of it. Great, thank you. Do I have a second of the motion? Mr. Turner. I second uh, the motion. Okay, any other further comment commissioners? 
I, I agree with Mr. Chris. I, I think um, the plan is in uh, complete conformance uh, with the rest of the neighborhood. Anybody else? Okay, I got to do the old roll call. Um, so I call the question. Uh, John Goodwin, I vote yes. Um, Kent Turner? Yes. Dick Ward? Yes. John Chris? Yes. Kristen Nielsen? Yes. Claire Tiscornia? Yes. Phil, Phil Williams? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, carries unanimously. Um, 146 Canoe Hill was continued. 316 Talmadge Hill Road. Do I have a motion for approval or denial? I move that it, that it be approved. I think that it's not, uh, uh, it's, it doesn't, it's not going to impact uh, any other neighbor. Uh, it, uh, the garage is, is in the dire need of, of repair. Um, the fact that they're putting a, um, a second floor on it uh, that's going to be a, a bit of a, of a fitness center is, is interesting. There's no problem with the staircase. The staircase is going to be enclosed in the back. Uh, and I'm assuming since the uh, septic was approved that uh, the septic situation is, is, uh, is, is, is acceptable also. Uh, because uh, given the little uh, half bath they're going to have in that years. So I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it, enhances, it enhances that property. There's not a whole lot around it to enhance, uh, given where it is. But it enhances the property. I think it enhances that, that area of the, that tiny little area of the town as well. So I, I think it would be approved. Okay, great. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Mrs. Escornia seconds. Any other discussion to the motion? Mr. Goodman? Yeah. Um, would the commissioners be um, okay with adding the condition from the zoning board approval that there's no kitchen facilities? Um, yeah. Was that already on the, or am I confusing applicant? Well, anyway, I'll, I'll go to Mr. Flynn. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I thought they had the approval from the zoning board. See, am I wrong? Wrong? That condition in, didn't they? I'm sorry? I thought that was approved. Well, it was already a, yeah, was, it, was this the one where there was already a ZBA condition yes. that they can't have it? Yeah, it was approved and the ZBA put on the condition with their variance that they can't put a kitchen or cooking area into that garage. Space. Okay, so you're recommending we do that as well? Yes. Fine. Yep. Okay, Good. Mr. Flynn is fine with that. Any other discussion of the motion? Okay, I also know it's a, it's a double front yard lot um, so I think, you know, from my perspective, that also contributes um, to some of the issues. Um, so I call the question, John Goodwin, I vote yes. Jack Flynn? Yes. Dan Radman? Yes. Ken Turner? Yes. Dick Ward? Yes. John Chris? Yes. Kristen Nielsen? Yes. Claire Tiscornia? Yes. Phil Williams? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. That carries unanimously. 635 Frogtown Road was continued. Um, what I'd like to do, we'll go into the regular meeting. For now, I'd like to skip items six and seven. We'll come back to that later. Um, but why don't we handle um, our regular meeting application? So we'll start with 162 Park Street upon application, Stephen Finn, Wolvesie, Grose, and Quest, and Kuriansky. Authorization for M2 Partners, LLC, owners for a special permit modification of sections A2B60 and site plan of section A2A to amend conditions numbers 40 and 50 of the commission's November 29, 2016 special permit and site plan approvals for property in the POMZ, Mr. Uh, Finn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, everybody. Again, uh, uh, for the record, it's Steve Finn representing M2 Partners LLC, the owner of the property. And with me are Arnold Karp and Paul Stone of M2 Partners LLC. Um, the application seeks to amend two conditions of the, the original special permit, which was approved by the commission in November of 29, 2016. As the chairman just indicated, this is on your regular hearing uh, uh, docket today. Uh, I did receive from Lynn today uh, two emails uh, re requesting a public hearing that were sent to Lynn by Terry Cody Spring and Jack Trafaro. And, um, I thought I would address that quickly. Um, um, I, I think with all respect to Terry and Jack, I think they're perhaps miscomprehending what's, at, what's an issue with regard to this pending application. 
the fence that we're talking about in condition number 40 is not anywhere near the cemetery. Uh, the cemetery fences are required by conditions number 58 of the original approval and conditions four through 10 of the modified approval. Those conditions, uh, those, those six or seven conditions are not impacted at all by an amendment to condition number 40 which concerns a, uh, a fence between uh, uh, Mead Commons and an access way owned by uh, uh, M2 Partners LLC. It's not near the cemetery. Um, condition number 40 and specifically was the subject of a negotiation with attorney Mike Sweeney of Mead Commons back at the time of the original application and it addressed Mead Commons' concern that access to this pedestrian access way easement that runs across the middle of the property in a south-north direction uh, would allow, would entice or in, uh, invite people to access that pedestrian access way easement through the Mead Commons property. So they wanted a fence constructed along that access way to prevent um, people from being able to walk across Mead Commons property and access this pedestrian access way easement. The pedestrian access way easement does not include or go near to, to the cemetery and it doesn't impact the fences of, of the cemetery. Um, <clears throat> the uh, other condition uh, um, in issue tonight is condition number 50 regarding uh, materials used in the Mead and the Maple Street parking area. And that uh, condition was actually suggested by the applicant, M2 Partners LLC, at the time of the application. No. It really does not, it has to do with a material uh, alteration, not any real substantive, uh, uh, you know, with regard to the cemetery or anything else. And so I continue to submit that a public hearing is not necessary these are minor amendments and are not material alterations in, in issue here. And the commission is well within its discretion and its authority under the your zoning regulations to go forward without another public hearing. It might be somewhat different if Terry or Jack spoke to these issues, these particular conditions at the original application, but I don't believe Mr. they Finn? did. They were focused Mr. on Finn? Mr. Finn? Yes. Uh, if you don't mind, let's move on, please. Understood. So I finished. So your timing was perfect, Mr. Goodwin. Um, so, I'll try to be earlier next time. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so with regard to condition number 40, that's the one regarding the fence. Um, uh, there have been discussions with Meet Commons uh, even before we filed the application. And recently there was a letter submitted by uh, a partner of Mr. Sweeney's uh, making suggestions about how we might be able to compromise that. That letter was received, I saw it for the first time over the weekend. The attorney who submitted that letter is attorney Deborah Broncato. Uh, I've been in touch with uh, Deborah today and we are gonna try to work out a compromise. So with regard to condition number 40, I'm suggesting that we not go forward with that in substance today that that part of the application be continued in the next hearing with the hope that we can resolve uh, things with me common. That's good news, duly noted, Mr. Finn. Okay. Um, with regard to condition 50, as I just mentioned, uh, that provides that the Maple Street Courtyard shall be a stamped decorative concrete as stated by the applicant. Final materials for the walkway, ex excluding asphalt, shall be reviewed and approved by the zoning inspector uh, prior to the issuance of the zoning permit. <clears throat> the area we are discussing is a driveway and surface, surface parking area off of Maple Street. And if any of the commissioners need help of a reference, it's shown on exhibit C of our materials. And I guess you can let Lynn know if uh, seeing a site plan would be helpful to you. Uh, other than that, I just plan to proceed. If, but if anyone needs help with commissioners, whatever we're uh, talking about. Commissioners, would you like to have uh, Mrs. Avney put that on the screen? Please. Okay. Yes. Then you got that? Yeah. Okay. While she's working on that, Mr. Finn, feel free to proceed. Uh, <clears throat> so you'll see on the, on the 
exhibit that Lynn's going to put up that there's a, also, there's a condominium to the west of that parking area called Maple Park Common that abuts the parking area and it also has an easement across it to access parking spaces uh, at that condominium. After the applicant suggested uh, using the stamped decorative concrete, uh, there's the site plan. It's on the right hand side of your screen about midway uh, in the middle of the, of the picture on the right hand side. You can see the parking spaces I, I trust. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, Lynn, go to the right side. There you go. Yes. Yeah, that's the right. area. You can see the easement uh, to the, to the uh, west. That's in the upper, a little slightly above where the parking spaces are. So that's the area we're talking about. Uh, the applicant had suggested putting this stamp decorative concrete into that area, but later determined that that material is not really suitable for this particular use, uh, especially in the Northeast. That material uh, is not durable and is subject to significant cracking, crumbling, and disintegration. Uh, our original application provided uh, photographs of this material which has been used on Elm Street in New Canaan and it in particular was used in some of the crosswalks across Elm Street uh, in downtown New Canaan. The photographs really illustrate the problems with this material and uh, those photographs are shown in exhibit F and again to the extent the commissioners have not seen the photographs or want to see, oh, there we go. That's stamped decorative concrete. You can see uh, cracking. You can see even where someone tried to repair it using blacktop uh, on the bottom part of the picture that Lynn's showing. There are some other photographs taken that shows more significant cracking. There you go. You can see the cracking of this material. You can also see that it it's, it's not very durable, that a lot of the stones there have already started to get rounded off by uh, traffic and, and use. And so um, it also, frankly, uh, poses a, a, a tripping hazard when you have material that's disintegrating and you're getting gaps and holes and cracks. So uh, the, the applicant seeks uh, a modification of that condition number 50 to substitute black asphalt for that material. We believe it's much more durable uh, and much safer and will last much longer. Um, and um, we also submitted a photograph of the way that area would look if the commission were to grant the substitute and that's exhibit G. So that's the photograph of the parking area. And that's the way it would look with black concrete. You know, I, I think all of us know that most of our parking areas in New Canaan are that surface. Uh, they're not decorative stamp concrete. And uh, I think it looks great. And uh, I think all in all that, uh, that there's not much to, 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 to discuss with regard to this particular modification. Um, so at that, I'll turn it over to back to you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Finn. Uh, questions for the applicant? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Steve, you mentioned you said black asphalt and you also said black concrete. What's the Yeah, thank, thank you, Jack. It, my understanding, it's black asphalt. Sorry for the thank you. And is that acceptable to anybody else who's got a... a, a, a uh, the the, the ring here is, has an interest in this. Um, I don't know if uh, if um, uh, the uh, condominium that shares that parking lot were was consulted on that issue or not. Um, I don't. I know that Arnold and and Paul were on. They may speak to that. I got a feeling that they were not. Uh, they were not asked about that substitution. Um, I don't they, think that. I'm sorry, Mr. Flynn, sorry. No, excuse me, go ahead, excuse me. Um, you know, I, um, I am very confident that they did not 
request any particular material for that uh, parking lot area at the time of the original application. Um, and so I, I, I can't represent that they don't, they haven't changed their mind, but I, I can't speak any further about that. Okay, I, I was under the impression they, the condo uh, group had been consulted with the initial determination as to what that material would be, that they agreed with the, the concrete. I, I, I'm not at all saying I agree with that, but I, I think they ought to be uh, consulted. No. Uh, we look. I mean, they, they we can certainly do that between uh, now and the next hearing. The hearing's going to have to stay open uh, to see if we can resolve uh, and compromise the issue about the fence along Mead Common. So we can we can we can solicit their views on that. Steve, I can speak to that. The they have an easement over our parking lot. They don't really get a choice of finishes. And the reason we're changing the finishes is it's not beneficial for them. Part of the issue is they park on our easement and putting as you know, putting a colored concrete down means we're going to have a harder time uh, isolating their parking spaces uh, to write either reserved or their unit numbers, whatever they want on it. So that's one of the reasons we've come back. Mr. Turner. Thanks. Thank you, Mom. Mr. Um, Mr. Finn, would you be so kind to show me the area that um, would become asphalt? I'm, I, I still haven't seen a drawing that would indicate the limits. Uh, Mr. Turner, it would be the, the entire parking area shown on Exhibit C. Uh, so I it would be every, every hard paved area, the entire project. Uh, that I can't speak to, but the only, the only condition we're seeking to amend is condition number 50, which called for stamp decorative concrete in that particular area. Well, please help me out. What is <clears throat> meant by that particular area? You know, where, what's the extent of it? Lynn, can you blow that up? It's in the right hand corner. Mr. Turner, it's the, it's the part that says proposed driveway and parking area that Lynn is highlighting with the cursor. That That is the only area that you want to change to asphalt? Correct. Yes. What is the material um, with the other drive area? Uh, the other driveway uh, has always been scheduled for asphalt. What you may be thinking about is the brick walkway that runs off that driveway through the project and out onto Maple Street. That stays the same. That stays the same. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, any commissioners? Anybody else? Mr. Uh, Chris. Yes. Um, gentlemen, you uh, mentioned that the uh, materials that uh, were originally approved, the stamped decorative concrete, simply doesn't last long and is subject to damage. Um, there's also stamped uh, concrete in the retaining walls uh, facing Park Street. Is that similar material and can that have degradation too and uh, other unsightliness? It's, it's a different material, Mr. Chris, and it's, uh, it's also- It's just gone a little louder, please. <clears throat> okay, hold on. You have to speak up, Paul. Yes, hold on, I'm turning up my microphone. Uh, it's a different material. Can you hear me now? Keep going. Yeah, it's a different, it's a different material. Um, it's a different mix and it's a different application. Um, the, the vertical wall doesn't take vehicular traffic or pedestrian traffic. Um, and so it, it's a totally different application. So that retaining wall would take, uh, it's, it's gonna last the ages. Un unlike a stamped concrete wood on a driving path. A, a further answer would be that one's a horizontal surface where water puddles and the other is a vertical surface. But you'll notice on the retaining walls, those are actually capped with uh, natural stone to prevent any desert degradation over time. Okay, anybody else? 
Okay, everybody good? So we will continue this. Uh, Mr. Stone and Mr. Carr for next month, uh, I have a question for you, I'm curious. When I looked at the access way and there's that guardrail there, um, can you, I mean, I was shocked that there would be, you know what I'm talking about, it's anchored to a tree at one end. Just next month, I'd be curious to hear, I mean, I was shocked it was there, don't know why. And is there anything we can do about that? Maybe the answer is no, but for next month, if we chat about it. John, I can actually give you a quick answer. It's not our guardrail. Oh. It actually belongs, it's somewhat on our property, but largely on the condominium property down below. To the south? Yeah. Right. Okay, got it. Okay. We, you know. John, uh, John I just okay. have a yeah. quick. I have a quick question. Uh, the fire marshal weighed in as to the access and the visibility on that walkway relative to this fence. Uh, why is that? Is it meant in, in the final plan? Is that supposed to be fire access or vehicular access along that pathway? I thought it was strictly a walking path. It, it is, but it would be an emergency only in the event of emergency. The fire department would like to have that as an option for access. So yes, it's meant for pedestrian, uh, but in the rare and hopefully you know, never event of an emergency, the fire department would like to have that available to them. Or okay. truck access? Yes. So does that mean it's going to be paved a certain way for rated truck access and the width of it's going to be increased given the existing plantings on both sides? It, it, it would be, uh, what, what's in the plans currently, the approved plans is, is asphalt and it doesn't have to be, um, it's not a, a rated, it's, it's on earth. Um, and so it would be rated for a uh, fire vehicle. Um, and then the width is exactly what the fire marshal was concerned about. Um, okay. Any fence would encroach on that access way and he would prefer it not, not to have any fence whatsoever. Dan, Dan, I can further enlighten you. The brick path that I mentioned uh, when I, Kent was speaking, that brick right. path is actually uh, rated for fire trucks. So, because it's really driving over the parking garage. So it's all built to withstand vehicular traffic, but the intent is no vehicular traffic. Got it. Thank you. I think also, Arlen and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the access way that we're speaking about was when this was you know, Merritt Apartments was used for vehicles. Correct. And we've turned it, we've, our intent is that it's, it's really pedestrian, um, but we're sort of tied in by the uh, steel wall that uh, John mentioned, the guardrail and the property line that uh, the condominium uh, complex has next door. So it, it has to be asphalt. Yeah. Yes, it's always, it's always it been, at, it has a brick entry and a brick exit, but it's always been an asphalt paved access way. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And just to be clear, it's not going to be used for vehicular access other than perhaps emergencies. So that correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anybody else before uh, we, Mr. Turner? I just um, have an observation. Um, the um, I respect the fire marshal's desire to have that access through that area. Um, if you look at the Park Mead condominiums, there's a parking lot that they could have access to. Um, the uh, the merit apartments um, and also the uh, apartments on the south have a parking lot so there are other ways to gain entrance egress into the site so i'm not sure that uh, you know what's driving the uh, fire marshal to um, you know want to have this access other than it would be nice I, I think they could get a lot closer uh, in the event of an emergency if they were to drive north on that access way, um, because w what we're proposing is not having a fence along that long, narrow panhandle. They could continue further north and get closer to the buildings on what Arnold mentioned was a, <clears throat> a rated, uh, rated for fire vehicles center walkway. But... Um, <clears throat> To answer your question, it would just get the, the vehicles that much closer to the buildings than anything on 
the park mead commons parking lot could thank okay. you okay everybody good okay um this will be continued to our june meeting thank you very much um item uh 8b 842 bonus bridge road upon application gregory sage is authorized agent for the national trust for Preservation <coughs> owners for a special permit modification due to the COVID-19 crisis of sections 326C16 and A2B to allow modifications of conditions of special permit of the commission's January 27, 1998 modified on September 24, 2019 authorizing use of 842 Ponus Ridge as a limited public access museum, the glass house for property in the two acre zone at 842 Ponus Ridge Road, Mr. Sages. Good evening, commissioners, and thank you. My name is Greg Sages. I'm the executive director of the Glass House. Uh, I would like to appear this evening for two possible modifications to existing activities permitted under our current permit. One pertains to tour operation and the second pertains to our annual fundraiser. Um, as you know, the governor has issued guidelines for reopening sectors of the economy in Connecticut. One of them is outdoor museums and zoos. Although we have not been historically an outdoor only museum, uh, under these guidelines, we would have to operate in that fashion. Uh, as with all the sectors though, social distancing is a primary criteria to ensure the safety of both uh, visitors and uh, workers. Uh, with the current permit requiring us to bus people from downtown uh, visitor center to the site, we're unable to achieve the uh, social distancing requirements of minimum of six feet. Um, so I'm here to ask for permission to have a limited number of vehicles drive directly to the site. Uh, we have parking accommodation for 10 on site and to the extent that there would be any overflow, uh, I'm asking for uh, the opportunity to have those people park at West School, which is currently not uh, functioning. Uh, the second item is uh, with regard to our annual fundraiser, which was approved for June 13th. Uh, we're unable to uh, carry off a, a fundraiser on June 13th, and we'd like to move the date to August 15th with the uh, parameters that were already approved in place except of course for the number of people, which was approved for 500, but I can't tell you what the right number will be that the governor would allow at that point in time, but I'd like to be able to move it to August 15th, subject to whatever guidelines the, the governor issues for gatherings. I can go into more detail on tours if, uh, if you care to. There are uh, questions for Mr. Sages? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, uh, Dick Ward. Uh, one, you talk about overflow cars into West School. Is there any limit on that as to the number of vehicles? Uh, when, when during the day w would that happen? Would, would visitors just be able to arrive whenever they wish and then walk across bonus ridge which can be a problem and secondly west school who approves outside parking at west school is that something that the uh, board of education has to approve so i'll start with the uh, last question first yes the board of education needs to approve it I've requested such permission, but have not yet received an answer. Um, as to visitation, or as we have in the past, all ticket sales will be online in advance of the tour, minimizing the interaction between staff and visitors uh, under this scenario. Our tour schedule will be made available for a limited duration. I'm suggesting no more than a month to accommodate any changes that the governor may issue in his guidelines. Um, all buildings must remain closed and we're not allowed to uh, do any guided tours. So we're envisioning a grounds pass only uh, with a total number of 25 visitors at the property at any one time maximum uh, and no group of individuals more than five people. 
Uh, although the site is 49 acres, uh, visitation would be restricted to the upper 13 acres, which provides a lateral swath parallel to uh, Ponus Ridge, extending from uh, DeMonts to the, the red and black building at the uh, gate of the property over to the sculpture gallery and then down to the uh, to the pond level. Will instruction be given to visitors as to uh, where to park and how to proceed from the West School parking to the glass house area? Yes, so uh, I don't envision there being much use of West School, but I just need a place in case because I don't know how many people will show up in any given car. Um, so yes, there will be uh, parking attendants that will uh, direct the traffic. All the, all the uh, instructions will also be part of the uh, ticket purchasing uh, scenario online. And uh, we will also have uh, signage as is being required in downtown merchants, as I understand it, indicating the uh, restrictions and, and conditions under which visitation is allowed to our glass house site. So for instance, uh, masks, etc. Will it be clear that there will be no uh, parking permitted on side streets, on neighborhood streets? Yes. Will there be a fixed time period for which this uh, exception would exist? So, I mean, that's a function, I guess, of how, how long the, uh, uh, the virus impacts things and how long the governor's guidelines are in effect. Um, so I don't have a finite duration for it. That is one of the um, questions that was raised by several of the neighbors uh, who are aware of the uh, requests being made tonight. Uh, so I don't know exactly how to answer it. I mean, we could say for the, uh, you know, till, till school reopens uh, and then later in the uh, uh, late summer, I would have to come back and, uh, you know, indicate if schools are not opening and that parking lot is not, uh, not being used, then maybe we would continue the operation. But if the school is, is open and the parking lot is being used, uh, then I'd have to uh, restrict the number of uh, cars, so only that which we can accommodate on the property. The intended duration of visits is, it's a one hour grounds pass. Uh, so, and as I say, we would, uh, you know, sell all tickets in advance of the uh, tour date and time. Would there be any staff assistance given to visitors to be sure they know where to park and to assist perhaps in crossing over uh, Ponus Ridge to the Glass House property? Yes, we intend to do both of those and also to have several people on the property to uh, gently remind us necessary about social distancing and to uh, restrict the uh, uh, distance that the visitors travel on the property so as to not affect the neighbors and to also not wander off to, a, to an extent that they wouldn't get back in time for their one hour to uh, expire. Okay. Would it be acceptable to you to have a, a definite uh, expiration period, say two months, then for the, to come back to the commitment if the uh, governor has not changed or conditions have, or schools have not yet resumed that you come and then ask for a further extension? So, um, yes, I mean, that would be acceptable as long as I can get on the agenda to uh, extend if necessary. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Everybody good? Okay, thank you, Mr. Sages. Thank you all. Okay, let's take a vote on this. Uh, do I have a motion uh, for approval or denial of 8B842 Bonus Ridge Road? Mr. Turner? I um, make a motion to approve. I, um, believe, Reasons for approval? I believe that the uh, proposed actions uh, will not have a 
adverse effect on the neighborhood. It's a limited period of time. Uh, these are very challenging circumstances and uh, the livelihood of this institution um, is at stake. And um, I believe that uh, within the POCD, uh, we have um, discretion in um, approving something of this magnitude under these circumstances. Do I have a second? I second it. Mr. Flynn, uh, further discussions of the motion, I guess the, the one issue is the time limit for the approval, uh, Mr. Board brought up two months. I would suggest three months. We know that if, if West School goes back into operation, then they can no longer use the lot. There's a possibility that West does not go into operation. I am think two months only gets us through July. I would suggest we at least get ourselves through August, um, Mr. Mm -hmm. Turner. That is uh, fine with me and I would like to uh, highlight a couple of uh, conditions. Um, I think the, um, it's imperative that there are some kind of um, uh, guards or um, people that are able to um, uh, monitor the parking. Um, there should be passes given so that they could be a plaque or something that perhaps is put on the dashboard so that um, people know what, where, what these cars belong to. And, um, you know, and just as an idea, but I think we need to have a few uh, means of controlling the crowds and, um, you know, the what if scenarios. And um, I think that we need to uh, add that to as part of the. Uh, and what, what if uh, we made, uh, you know, uh, uh, pursuant to a submission of a plan to the planner, acceptable to the planner? Would, would, does that yeah. get there? That's perfect. Okay. I would suggest that we, we cannot uh, approve what is in the uh, Board of Education's purview. So I, I think we have to make it somehow a condition that is subject to approval by the Board of Education parking at West School. Good point. Mr. Turner, acceptable to you? Yes. Great. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I'd, I'll note, uh, you know, echo everything Mr. Turner said, also reading their application, you know, their preliminary game plan is a good one. West School is pretty much across the street from, you know, the, the edge of their property. Um, so I think they can, uh, it'll be fairly easy for them to do uh, ground control, uh, crowd control. I also think, quite frankly, this felt the property values of the neighbors because, uh, you know, we were not in the money business, but these guys need to make money. And if they're not making money and that place falls into disrepair, that is going to negatively impact the property values of all those neighbors. Anybody else? Okay, call the question. John Goodwin, I vote yes. Uh, Jack Flynn? Yes. Dan Radman? Yes. Ken Turner? Yes. Dick Ward? Well, subject to the condition stated and that the zoning uh, planner approve. Yeah, per the conditions uh, Mr. Turner agreed to. Uh, Mr. Chris? Yes. Ms. Nielsen? Yes. Ms. Discornia? Ms. Discornia? Sorry, she muted. Hold on one second. Sorry. I didn't see that she muted herself. Yes. Mr. Sorry. Williams? Mr. Williams? Yes. Okay, great. Carries unanimously. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, Item uh, number six, planning subcommittee. Um, sorry. Uh, Krista, um, maybe just a, a one minute debrief on what got discussed tonight and, and next month. Okay. Um, so tonight we had three agenda items on the subcommittee meeting. The first was discussing changes to 7.1B3, which um, distinguishes which uh, non-conforming structures have to come for approval by planning and zoning versus ZBA. Um, and so I, I think where we landed on that was that we're fine with everything coming to planning and zoning commission. Um, uh, we also discussed senior housing, um, just getting a sense of where everyone stands in terms of what it might look like in different locations in town um, and you know scale all of those things. Um, and so Lynn and I are gonna do some research on that and come back uh, with some ideas of things that have been done other places next month. 
And then lastly, we briefly discussed the B residential zone, the apartment zone, and the multifamily zones. Um, we discussed that we like the attached housing in the B residential zone, rather uh, attached duplexes in the uh, B residential zone better than the detached single family homes, which are currently allowed. Um, and we also discussed that I'll talk to Glenn Childler about the differentiation between the purposes of the multifamily zone and the apartment zone and, um, you know, how we want to use those most effectively. And so we'll come back next month with updates on all of that. Okay, great. Thank you. And then item number seven, discussion of economic recovery efforts. Uh, I'll just make a few comments. Um, the 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 objectives that I, I laid out, which is in the near term, ideally the commission stay out of the way of the reopening as, as much as possible, and this be kept at the administrative level, um, was uh, basically achieved. Now the way it was achieved was things came down from the governor and then were implemented by the town. Um, and the one thing I will say is I, I, I was not involved on a day-to-day -day basis, but I did have some participation and was able to observe the effort. And my hat is off to uh, many, many people in the town of New Canaan, all of town hall from the first selectman down to each department worked extremely hard on getting things up and going. You know, I sometimes use the line of, you know, this isn't my first rodeo. Well, this was the town's first rodeo. And, and I have to say it was pretty intense last week. I mean, people, you know, at the town level were working 24 by 7, which included Lynn, by the way. Um, so not everything went off perfectly. Um, but I, I think, you know, as much as it could be, and particularly with, a, you know, my view, a lot of the handcuffs that were still imposed because it was an edict by the governor. And, and, and this is just my personal opinion. You know, I think there were too much limitations were not enough um, in some respects of local decision making allowed. Um, but I thought the town, you know, did just a wonderful job of pulling it off. Um, and I think, you know, from our perspective, I, I think what we've done, you know, tonight with um, the Glass House is, is the right role for us is, is to be able to jump in quickly when there is a special permit approval. You know, the site plan, a lot of the, you know, the immediate crisis driven site plan work can go through uh, Lynn's department. You know, as I said last month, you know, we have the ability to push site plans into administrative approval, but special permits have to go through us. So I'm happy that worked very well. And it also, you know, quite frankly, I think it gives us a little bit of an opportunity to focus on the long game and specifically with Krista getting the subcommittee up and going again. And, you know, we can do some planning here. Um, Lynn, anything you would add? No, I think you've covered it nicely. Thank you. Okay, great. I actually, I was hoping Kevin Moynihan would be on tonight because I, I was hoping he'd give a little, little bit of a brief, but, um, but it, you know, it, it, I, I went out to Elm Friday night and it was just the most wonderful feeling in the world to be sitting outside with my mask next to me when I was eating, I was not wearing my mask. Otherwise I did wear my mask. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's just phenomenal to try to get this place going, up and going again. And let's all grab our masks and do some shopping in town. Anybody else? Okay, let's move on. Um, item number nine, approval of the minutes, April 28th, 2020. Does anybody have any items there? Lynn, I have an item. Uh, I don't have the minutes in front of me. But under the subcommittee, I think I might have been quoted saying this, uh, an open window to work on senior housing. I think what we had to need to add there is an open window to do long-term planning, including senior housing. Okay, we'll add it. Okay, great. Anybody else? Okay, we have a motion to approve the minutes. I move that we approve the minutes. I have a second. Okay. John Chris seconds it. Legally, I have to go through the roll call. This is embarrassing, but here it goes. John Goodwin, aye. Jack Flynn. Yes, aye. Dan Radman. Aye. Kent Turner. Aye. Dick Ward. I recused. I was not attending. Okay. Uh, John Chris. Aye. Krista Nielsen. Aye. Claire Tiscornia. Oh, sorry, Claire. You muted yourself. Sorry. <laughs> Just go like this, Claire. 
<laughs> Hi. <laughs> Bill Williams. Hi. Okay, motion to adjourn. John, uh, a question. Yeah. How do I get to review the April uh, Zoom meeting? Is, is that something Lynn has? Lynn? Um, so it is actually, the town has a YouTube site and everything's on the YouTube site and it's also on channel 79. I'll send you the link and um, I'll see if we can put it on a flash drive. I'm not sure, but I know it's running on the YouTube site. So I'll send you the link to watch it. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Everybody uh, have a, uh, have a great rest of the week. Take care. Everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.